Okay, so what we're going to see here are the different ways that the cell cycle can be regulated between external signals as well as internal signals to help the cell promote through different phases of the cell cycle. So when we look at the two types of signals, you have the external signals that would include growth factors. Um, it also has uh, density dependent inhibition and anchorage dependence play a role in whether or not cells will divide. And then when we look at internal signals, these are going to include our promoting factors, um, which basically are made out of cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. So when we look at our options with the cell cycle, you have the external signal, the growth factor, as well as the internal um, molecules to help it move from like G1 to S or S to G2, G2 to M phase and move through the cell cycle. So when we look at internal messages, they're going to help the cell promote through. So we're going to look first at external signals. So some external signals, you have growth factors uh, that help coordinate um, actions between cells and uh, help cells know when to divide or not. Um, anyway, so one of the things though is density dependent inhibition and crowded cells will actually stop dividing. Um, and when we look at an example of this, so when scientists remove some cells from a petri dish, they continue to divide uh, until they're all touching each other. And then when they remove some, they replaced it. But now how do cells know if they're crowded or not? Because they're not, like they don't have a brain and they don't think. So let's go ahead and look at, here's a cell. And on this cell, there are some, you know, proteins on the surface. So here we have cell adhesion molecules called CAM, um, and the purple double bars right here represent like a tyrosine kinase. Here you see the GDP is an inactive G protein. So uh, there's another protein called a RAS protein that is basically like a relay protein or part of the phosphorylation cascade and messaging within a cell. So here, if a cell receives a growth factor, ligand, um, you have some proteins that will interact within the cell. It'll activate that G protein to become active, and it'll pass the message on. Um, and then the RAS will activate the phosphorylation cascade that leads to the cell response. Now, in this case, the cell response is cell division, mitosis. You get a new cell. However, if you have two cells touching and their cell adhesion molecules are like together like this, that changes the way the proteins interact. And you don't have to stress too much about the significant, like the fine details of this. But basically what's going to happen is you're going to see how even though a growth factor attaches, um, the way the proteins are interacting, it basically gets um, blocked from communicating with the RAS protein. So therefore, if the RAS protein is not activated, there's no phosphorylation cascade, and there's no cell response, and the cells stop dividing. So that's how they kind of know that they're attached or like touching another cell. And so how do cells know when to stop dividing is your box eight. So when we look at other examples of growth factors or how growth factors work, a growth factor will attach to a protein receptor on the cell membrane, like a tyrosine kinase and basically activate a phosphorylation cascade that leads to a cell response within the cell. So a very cool example is platelet-derived growth factor. So in platelet-derived growth factor, if you have like a cut in your skin, well then uh, platelets are gonna come to form the scab. Well, if you have a cut in your skin and there's a scab forming, that means there's an opening in your first line of defense in your skin where pathogens can enter inside. So therefore, you're gonna to need to repair that intrusion by building new skin cells to repair that wound. So the platelet-derived growth factor comes from basically your scab, your platelets, um, and therefore they will communicate to nearby cells. Those cells will become active, uh, actively dividing. They'll go through um, the cell past G1 into S, G2, um, and M phase and divide and make new cells and go through mitosis and cytokinesis and repair the wound. And so when PDF atta PDGF attaches to the receptor protein, you have your signal transaction pathway followed by cell division. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at internal signals. So um, one of the cool experiments that was done back in a couple decade, 
decades ago, uh, was that scientists took a cell that was um, in M phase. You can see right here this M phase cell, and then a cell that was in G1. And what they did is they um, like joined the cytoplasm. You can see here the cytoplasm is joined, and what they found was that the cell in G1, even though G1 is a cell just living its life, it began to go through the motions or the actions of an actively dividing cell. So um, even though the DNA hadn't been replicated yet, uh, it began to condense, the nuclear envelope began to break down, all things you see in M phase were happening in the cell in G1. So this is the first like experiment where scientists really realized, wow, there's internal signals communicating on what needs to happen at different steps of the cell cycle. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. So here you have the cell cycle. Um, and in the cell cycle, you have, um, there's chemical, sorry, there's chemical signals in the cytoplasm that control the progression throughout the cell cycle. And so with this, one of those signals is cyclin. And the amount of cyclins will vary as the cell goes through different phases. Um, and these are our cell cycle regulators on the inside of the cell. So we have um, G1 uh, cyclins, G1 slash S, S phase cyclins, as well as M cyclins. So when we look at this, so like here in G1 is the area in blue. What we have, I don't know, there you go, is... Um, like cyclins specific to G1, there are cyclins specific to the G1, like S checkpoint, and we have cyclins for S phase, as well as cyclins um, specific for uh, like the G2 M phase. So now with this, uh, my animation is probably not going to play very well uh, on how I'm showing this, but as the cell goes through the um, uh, goes through the checkpoints. The amount of cy like as it goes through the cell cycle, the cyclins are going to. Um, here, let's see if I can fix this real fast and play it for you. So, if we look here um, at. Oh, it's not. Okay. So, let's see if we can see this a little bit better. So, when we look at um, how this works, as the cell goes through the cell cycle, what's going to happen? is that, um, we'll play it again, the cyclin, it's made and degraded at appropriate times as you go through the cell cycle. So here in G1 or like the G1S checkpoint, those cyclins are there temporarily and then they're degraded. And so um, as cyclins go through the checkpoint, um, you can kind of see how uh, they, Let's see if we can play it again. So as we go through the cell cycle, what's going to happen is that the G1 checkpoint, S phase checkpoint um, cyclins will be made and then be degraded. And that like the G2 M checkpoint, the cyclins will be made and then be degraded. So these cyclins get their name because they cycle between synthesis and degradation during the cell cycle. So let's go ahead and see cyclins role in regulation and how it works. So uh, when we think about each phase of the cell cycle, each phase, like S phase versus G2 versus M phase, all have specific things that need to happen. So in S phase, we need to make copies of the DNA. So if we need to go through DNA replication, that means that you need to activate DNA helicase enzymes, DNA polymerase 3, ligase, DNA polymerase 1, topoisomerase, like there's specific proteins essential to replicate DNA. Now, if the cell is like, if we think about a cell inside its nucleus, those enzymes aren't always active. And so we need to activate them at the correct time. Anyway, when we go into like M phase, so as going into M phase, specific things need to happen. We need to break down the nuclear envelope, the chromosomes need to condense. Um, so you need to activate the proteins required to make these things happen. Okay, so hopefully you remember kinases, and kinases are basically proteins that uh, transfer phosphate groups to activate other proteins. 
So um, back from our verbal test, here you have a protein kinase that basically is able to take a phosphate from ATP, and what it can do is it can transfer that phosphate group. And when that inactive protein receives that phosphate group, well, now it's active. So this very simply could be like, like this right here could be DNA polymerase 3 that now is becoming active and can begin to build a new complementary strand of DNA. So here we need um, like kinases in order to activate the proteins used during the cell cycle. So with this, there are special kinases in the cell cycle. We call these cyclin-dependent kinases. So they are dependent on cyclin. When cyclin attaches, that's how they become active. So here we have a cyclin-dependent kinase. And when there's no cyclin, this protein is inactive. They are not turning on any target proteins. So here, when cyclin attaches, though, this kinase is now active and can phosphorylate and turn on proteins needed during that particular phase of the cell cycle. So when it degrades, though, that cyclin is only temporary. As it goes through the cell cycle, cyclin is made and it's degraded. So when that cyclin is gone, though, that CDK goes back to inactive and it's no longer activating proteins in that part of the cell cycle. So here, when cyclin attaches CDK, it activates it, and now it can actually phosphorylate um, different proteins. Okay make them active. So you can see here in this graph how the different types of cyclin vary depending on which stage of the cell cycle is occurring. So if we look at this picture here, actually let's go ahead and look this one. So here I have the cell cycle and in G1 I'm going to have the CDK that's inactive right now because there's no cyclin attached. You can see right here there's no cyclin attached. Well when cyclin for the G1S phase um, like transition, when it attaches to that CDK, now you have an active kinase that can phosphorylate the proteins that are going to be needed to move the cell out of G1 into S phase. However, that's only a temporary movement. So that active kinase doesn't need to stay active. So that um, cyclin, it will actually degrade. And now you're left with an open, like empty, inactive CDK. However, S phase has its own proteins that need to be activated. DNA polymerase 3, helicase, etc. Proteins are going to hold the sister chromatids together. So now S phase has its own proteins we need to activate. So then S phase cyclin can come and attach to that CDK, activating it. Now you have like that um, S phase CDK becoming active and activating the necessary proteins for S phase. However, S phase doesn't last forever. So that CDK will go back to inactive when that S cyclin degrades. Then there's a specific um, step here from G2 to M phase, where now with this, you have your, um, your G G2 slash M phase cyclin will then be made. And when that attaches to the CDK, now you have, this is actually called MPF. M phase promoting factor. It's going to help the cell promote or move into M phase. So now like this particular CDK is going to then turn on the proteins or activate the proteins that are used to break down the nuclear envelope or to like condense the chromosomes. Uh, and so it's not, it doesn't last forever. It's going to also degrade and we'll move back into G1. So the cyclins vary throughout the cell cycle but the CDK stays constant, and each phase of the cell cycle has specific CDKs. So here, when we look at an inactive CDK, um, these target proteins are turned off. However, when the G1S um, cyclin attaches, you can see how now they are phosphorylated, and S phase can begin when the DNA replication enzymes are turned on. Okay, and so now we look at the M phase promoting factor, so with this, here we have um, uh, this together is called MPF, M phase promoting factor, because when it is going to like uh, phosphorylate certain target proteins, this is how the spindle fibers form, 
chromosomes condense, and the nuclear envelope breaks down. So that is my summary of 